Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Raja Ravi Varma, The Shaping of an Artist. Raja Ravi Varma was a trailblazer, a pioneer who broke new ground in the realm of art. And while his portraits garnered fame, fame and patrons both in the Indian nobility and Western communities, Varma's artistic legacy didn't stop there. His artistic journey expanded into Indian mythology, immortalizing the stories of Hindu gods and goddesses, as well as characters from the epics and the Puranas. At Avid Learning, we've been enamored by the artistry of Raja Ravi Varma. In one of our earlier events, the visual cultures of Kitsch in India, we traced the extraordinary journey of Raja Ravi Varma in building a unique Indian visual culture. In November of last year, we had the pleasure of launching the second volume of author and advocate Ganesh V. Shivaswamy's six-part masterpiece, Raja Ravi Varma, an everlasting imprint. It was fitting the event took place in Mumbai as the book details the Raja Ravi Varma Press, which was initially established in Bombay and commenced functioning in the year 1894. The extraordinary melange of art history offered a glimpse into the creativity and heritage and the enduring impact of this visionary artist and his association with the city. This left us all captivated by Ganesha's detailed exploration of Raja Ravi Varma's life. The depth of his insight he provided us left us yearning for more. And it's wonderful to have an opportunity to continue this conversation with Ganesh at the JLF and dwell deeper into the fascinating life and the enduring legacy of Raja Ravi Varma. Congratulations, Ganesh. Thank you. You know, Ganesh, your, your six-volume series is one of the most comprehensive collections of prints, paintings, photographs of India's foremost modern artist. I, I think the series spans 2,100 pages with 1,800 images. Let's start by telling us the genesis of the series and each volume. We have two of them out here, uh, from, concept of, from conception to research to editing. And how does your definite, definitive work differ from existing biographies documented by other scholars and academics? Thank you. Thank you, Asad, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Let me just put out the, I'm starting the PPT. The first slide. No. Ah, there. Okay, so this is the six volume set. Um, and uh, uh, starting from the right and moving all the way to the left, you have volume one, two, three, four, five, six. Volume one deals with how the artist created the image and the biography of the artist. So we're looking at the behind the scenes of how the image comes to be created. Volume two deals with the Ravi Varma press and what happens after the image goes into the public space. It um, charters a journey from painter to public. Volume three, so we look at four stages. We look at before the artist, we look at how the artist creates the image. We look, we look at what the Ravi Varma press does with the image. And lastly, we look at what happens when it gets into the public space. My analysis is the analysis of what happens when it reaches the common man, as against the uh, patrons, which uh, has uh, for the longest time been recorded. And then we use these four stages and explore several genres. So volume three deals with the images associated with worship. We're not only looking at Hinduism, we are also looking at other religions, Islam, Christianity, the saints, etc. Volume four is the largest volume of the series, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, 385 pages. Volume five is Krishna, Leela, and Nataka. It deals with the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Gita Govinda, and the plays, your Shakuntala and all of that. And the last volume is Power and Enchantment. It deals with images associated with power, and it deals with the allure of the feminine image. So we have six volumes in all, over 2,140 pages. Wonderful. So now as we embark on this discussion, dwelling into Raja Ravi Varma's life, work, could you paint a picture, no pun intended, of the artist's evolution? Uh, what influences or transformative movement, moments can we, can, we, can we talk about that highlight and play a significant role in shaping of his artistic vision and trajectory of his career? And you probably have some slides to go Yes, with I do. Uh, so, you know, uh, the thing is that Ravi Varma participates in a larger movement which is happening across India. India is synthesizing. Uh, we are bringing in cultures and attributes from outside. The way in which we are dressing is changing. The, the gentlemen are moving from dhotis and getting into Savile Row suits. The women are wearing stitched blouses. We are now 
talking in a different language. We are sitting differently from squatting onto chairs. So India is going through this process of synthesis and Ravi Varma's image participates in that synthesizing. So I want to actually show you how he does it through the visual images. So let's look at this painting. And this painting is Draupadi, uh, the one in the blue. And um, the lady at the back is um, Simhika. Now Simhika is not a character from the Mahabharata. Simhika is actually a character from the Kathakali play, Kirimira Vadam, written by Kotem Tambaran. Now, what's the story? The story is that Shraddullah and Simika were Asura and Asuri, husband and wife. And when they were in Vanavas, one of the Pandavas kills Shraddullah. So Simhika says, you killed my spouse, I'm going to kill yours. Uh, now, if life was that simple, we lawyers would have had no work. But, you know, uh, revenge is complicated. So what she does is she decides that she's going to transform herself into an enchantress, goes by the name of Lalita, and then comes up to Draupadi and tells Draupadi, you come with me to the forest. There's a temple there, and I obviously wanted to do away with her there. Draupadi is a little you know, hesitant. She's like, I don't know what's really going to happen. What I want to show you is I actually want to show you the sequence from the Kathakali play, just to tell you how Ravi Varma synthesizes a Kathakali play into something with academic realism. So look at the sequence from the Kathakali play. That is the pointing. So in case you still didn't get the parallel, there you have it. The hand gestures are exactly the same. The pronounced jawline is exactly the same. And even the aquiline face of Draupadi is exactly the same. And it is lifted exactly from a Kathakali play. But if the first slide, you never knew it came from a Kathakali play. And this is the mastery which Ravi Varma does. He synthesizes something like Kathakali and makes it academic. Let's look at another example. The one on the right, of course, is the reclining Nair lady. And it looks like an aristocratic Nair lady in a tarwad. She's there reading a book. And there's a lady fanning her behind her. But Ravi Varma takes it exactly from a European painting. Of course, an Orientalist theme painting. And the one which you're seeing on the left is actually from Ravi Varma's library. So we do know Ravi Varma did refer to this very work. And look at how exactly similar it is. But Ravi Varma synthesizes the European understanding of it with the Indian. And that's what Ravi Varma is doing. So the synthesis works really well most of the time. But sometimes it doesn't go too well. And let's look at the next one. And this is the prince on the tricycle. This portrait was actually um, exhibited at the Simla Art Society exhibition. And it comes under fire. One of the earliest critics, 1887, reports it in the Pioneer and actually says, you know, here is a prince who's supposed to come in beautiful Indian attire and he lands up in this European travesty. Uh, <laughs> the synthesis really doesn't go well sometimes. But of course, today we're all in suits and jeans and all of that. So Ravi Varma does participate in the same synthesis which India is also participating in. Sometimes it does exceedingly well, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's not a bad outfit, I'd wear it today. Uh, but, no. I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, um, we're sitting in Jaipur today, right? Steeped in rich cultural heritage and artistic traditions. You know, as the, the uh, you know, 
talking about patronage or patronage. You know, against that background, it's very interesting to see how Raja Ravi Varma's artistic journey intersected with significant royal patronage during his era. Um, please shed some light on how this helped his choices, themes, and his overall creative expression. How did, it, how did the sub royal support help him get there? So basically what happened is until Ravi Verma comes along, most of the royal commissions are associated with portraits. And how was Ravi Verma painting them? Ravi Verma was largely painting them using photographs. I don't think many of the royal sitters actually sat throughout the process of painting the picture. A photograph was handed over, the skin complexion was noted down in maybe a preliminary sketch and then the painting is done. And what you're seeing on the screen is Maharani Chimna by the second of Baroda. And the photograph on the right is in the Kilimanur Palace. So uh, that's the one which Ravi Varma refers to, to paint the one on the left. Most of the royals, starting with Pudukote, Baroda, Mysore, uh, Udaipur, started the commissions using portraits. But then what happens is the Maharaja Baroda, Saiji Rao Gaikwad, alters the nature of commission and gets into mythological works. So the patronage shifts, and it largely shifts with Ravi Varma. And after Ravi Varma, now you have a whole bunch of new artists like Durandar and all of that, starting this new genre, and the patrons also change. Now, this painting which you're seeing on the screen is in the Royal Gaikwad collection, and it, uh, uh, it's the marriage of Sita and Rama. Now, what actually happened here is that the painting was painted in Kilimanur, and then it is exhibited for the first time in Trivandrum, and then lands up in Bombay. And it is at the Bombay Art Society exhibition where it gets displayed. And here's this new trajectory in relation to democracy of art. Because when it goes here, there is a public demand for copies, which eventually results in the press. Um, you know, in tracing Raj Raja Ravi Verma's artistic journey, traditional biographies always focus solely on the artist at himself, overlooking the profound impact of external influences. Your series, however, takes a, a divergent approach, uh, casting a wider uh, web or net, um, uh, encapsulating his individual brilliance, but also paints a vivid picture of relationships and societal dynamics and some of the formidable influences surrounding him. Do you want to elaborate a little bit about that? So, you know, uh, when I embarked on writing the book project, a book, I started as writing a book and then it lands up becoming six volumes. The first question which I actually asked was, how am I going to address this artist who's been extensively written about? Is there anything new to be said in such an old narrative? And as you can see, there is actually a whole bunch of new stuff. And what we lawyers do when we argue a case is, what is the core argument? And for me, the core argument was, a brand is not built by one. A relay race is not won by one. So who are the other people who are participating in the process of building up the Ravi Varma brand? And so I look before and after. Right? And it is important for us to talk about other influences. So what you're looking on the screen here on the left is Ravi Verma's maternal uncle, Barani Tirunal Raja Raja Verma. A lot of people attribute the change into academic realism to Ravi Verma. But the reality was that actually started with this gentleman who painted not only in the Tanjo style, which you're seeing on top, but he also paints in the realistic style, which you see at the bottom. And it is this person who's Ravi Verma's first tutor. And so the pinpointing the shift into academic realism actually takes place here. It doesn't even start with Ravi Verma. So we're looking before. Let's look at another example. We're looking at the people who help in Ravi Verma building the image. And these people, according to me, are as important as the image itself. And who you're seeing on the screen on the right is this girl called Rajibai Mulgaonkar. Rajibai Mulgaonkar is the same girl who poses for Lakshmi. And in the third volume, you will see her in the same backdrop, and she's holding pencils in her hand, standing in the pose of Lakshmi. And those pencils become the lotus, and she becomes the Lakshmi. Now what's interesting here is the social dynamic, that she's a Kalavant, a Devadasi. So it's a Devadasi who helps build the Lakshmi image. 
And to me, she is as important as the painting itself because she's the one who helps build the image. Multiple dimensions of women empowerment at that point in time for somebody coming and posing for an artist, it, it, she was a very brave woman to have done something like that. So I try to track down who these people are. We give names to many of them, but there are some we can't give names to. Like for instance, this girl, we don't even know who she is. And you can make out that it's the photograph which actually becomes the painting. So we've gone, I've done so much, but there's still a lot more to be done. Wonderful. You briefly mentioned earlier, so volume one, the preface intriguingly touches upon the macro patterns and the role of art in contributing to democracy. Can you elaborate on the concept and the significance of Raja Ravi Varma's artistic work to democracy? contributions to democracy? So in the preface to volume one, that I laid down the argument within which we are going to do the analysis. And I say that uh, society generally, largely, uh, goes through several transformations. We go from revolution to industrialization, industrialization to democratization, and democratization to now digitization. Uh, Ravi Verma lives during the period of democracy. But if you look at it from the lawyer's vantage, Democracy is much more than just power. So if you look at the previous century, the early half of the century to the latter half of the century are dramatically and starkly in contrast with each other. You have monarchies ruling in the early part. You have democracies taking over almost entirely in the latter part. In the early part, religion is religious places of worship are very heavily controlled. And then with the temple entry proclamation and all of the rest, religious sites open up. Then you have education, controlled, free. And then you have wealth through distributive legislations. Uh, we have distributive legislations, the abolition of the Privy Purse, abolish, uh, the Wealth Tax Act, the Income Tax Act, the Reforms Act, the Urban Land Sealing Act. Wealth also gets democratized. So the argument and the question is, if power, education, religion, wealth, is all going from few to many, few to many, few to many. How could art not have followed? So the question is, it was bound to happen. The only thing is who surfed the tide? There comes a tide in the affairs of men, which when taken at flood leads on to fortune. Who surfed that tide? And it was the Ravi Varma legacy. So how does Ravi Varma's legacy participate in that? Because it was bound to happen. There was no way you could have stopped it. Wonderful. Uh, this, in this volume, there's a new painting that was introduced. Uh, it's called the Brave Kusumavati. Am I pronouncing it yes. correctly? Yeah. Yes. So what's the significance of this particular artwork, and how does it fit into the broader narrative of Rajarava Imamma's work? So this is the Brave Kusumavati. It's 1896. It features in color for the first time in this volume. It was heavily referenced. There are a number of newspaper articles about it, and it even features in the Kerala State Archives. It's mentioned there. But no one actually knew where the painting was. Uh, even Rupika Chavla went in search of it, but it doesn't feature in her volume. It, it landed up in a private collection and uh, features for the first time here. So what's actually the story of this painting is that she is um, uh, warding off the threat of a brother and she saves her lover who's in the blue. But you know what I like about this asset is the guy in blue is absolutely doing nothing. He's just standing there with his hands on his hips and saying, get on with it. Uh, are you finished with it? And you know, he's not even helping her. <laughs> just look at him. You know, it actually reminds me, every, I have to tell you, every morning I land up in front of my wife and I say, where's my coffee when she's battling the coffee machine? She says, are you the blue guy in the brave Kusumavati? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's exactly it. But what's interesting about this painting is, one, of course, it goes into the Bombay Art Society exhibition, so democracy there. But when uh, the Maharaj of Travancore wants a picture gallery established in Trivandrum, he says, send me a list of paintings which you want to display. And the first painting which is on the list is the Brave Kusmavati sent by Ravi Verma. Ravi Verma, uh, the Maharaja doesn't actually, uh, the Maharaja doesn't commission this. He commissions something else, and then it goes off into a private sale. You know, uh, just talk a little bit about the challenges in researching these books. I mean, you know, there's a lot of information available there. And what is intriguing is there's so many lesser known facts. So how did you go about finding oh. these? <laughs> so I have to tell you, I've been working on Ravi Varma for a long time. Although I How long? 
30 years. Um, but I actually started the project of writing the book five years ago. So I wanted to go and reacquaint myself with all of my old friends and said, okay, you know, come, let's take a look at this, that, and the other. And one instance is when I went into Kilimanur, the palace where Ravi Verma lived. Mm. And I finished researching all of the stuff. And you know, the photograph on the top right is actually Ravi Verma's library. And I took a scanner, sat on the floor, and scanned every single page like a Xerox guy. So I have this new fascination and you know, admiration for Xerox people who sit outside courts, <laughs> you know, make them scan and Xerox and all that. I'm like, okay, now I know what you guys go through. I uh, then finished it and one day I was actually walking out thinking, okay, my job is done. And I don't know for what reason, until today I don't know for what reason, I asked Ramavarma Tambaran and I said, where is the box? I don't know why I said it. He says, how do you know there's a box? I said, and he said, okay, come, let's go and see the box. And he takes me out into the inner depths of the palace, and that's the box which you see on the left. And when we opened it, the lid broke. And inside that box were all of these photographs of models, and they're looking at me, and then I'm like, oh, you're Lakshmi, and you're Damayanti, and you're this. And that's where the thing comes. But I have to tell you this in interesting story. So Ramavarma and I are sort of looking at this stuff, and I'm sort of figuring out what's going on. And both of us felt something eerie. And we actually saw this big white owl sitting on the sill of one of those windows. And Ramarmaji gets very emotional. I'm like, why are you getting emotional? He says, in our sort of area, a white owl is a noble ancestor. I'm like, oh, really? I have, I have to confess, I was scared if the owl would pick me. <laughs> OK, <laughs> is there an owl vaccine? And here, this man is emotional. Uh, and he's saying, you know, now your project is blessed. So that's, a, and then of course scanned everything. <laughs> scanned everything and then the photograph on the right is me in a Vashti and we put it all back, cleaned, sealed for posterity. So this is one of the very many. Oh, wonderful, hopefully there's no owl in this room blessing us, but yeah. <laughs> um, but let's move on to volume two in the interest of time. You know, before dwelling into the Ravi Varma press, um, you discuss about printing presses, particularly the, and I, I'm going to mess up this pronunciation, the Mumadi Krishna Raja Vadia, Vadiar? Vadiar. Vadiar involvement. So what, is, what was the history of the early printing presses and their significance in the context of Raja Ravi Varma? So there were very many printing presses before the start of the Ravi Varma press, which started in 1894. Lithography came into India in 18, so we're we are talking about, I'm not talking about intaglio printing, I'm talking about lithographic printing, actually comes into India in 1821, immediately after it was sort of uh, established in 1815. And one of the earliest Maharajas to establish a lithographic press was Mumadi Krishna Raja Vadir, the Maharaja of Mysore. That's Krishna Raja Vadir, the third. Uh, in Kannada, we call it Mumadi Krishna, Immadi Mumadi Nalvadi, uh, Mumadi Krishna Rajavadiya. And what is he using it for? Mm. He's using it to print something called the Sri Tattva Nidhi, which was nine volumes, and is considered the first encyclopedia of Indian iconography. Mm. And it's considered the go-to material for iconographic research. Nine volumes, and he was using it to print this. So actually, the attribution to religious imagery can go as far back as that. Then, of course, you have a number of other presses. You have the Chitrashala Press, you have the Calcutta Art Studio, and then you have the Ravi Verma Press in 1894. So I actually put the Ravi Verma Press in context of the larger history of printing. But he didn't, uh, Raja Ravi Verma didn't own his press, right? No. Yeah, that's what your volume says. It yeah. was owned by a, by a German contributing to a press functioning in a, a British India. Correct. So wasn't that a little bit of a stretch? No, oh, it, did well. no, it actually did quite well. So the Ravi Verma press was never actually owned by Ravi Verma. Uh, the press started as w an... Where in Bombay is this press? Uh, in Parel, uh, no. in Gurgaon. It was supposed to be next to the Portuguese church. Yeah. And after my launch, somebody actually took me through all the bylanes of Bombay and we couldn't find it. Um, but anyway, the interesting thing was Ravi Verma never owned the press. It started as an, a partnership with his brother, C. Raja Raja Verma and uh, Mohandas uh, uh, Govardhan Das Katao Makanji from the Katao Mills. Katao uh, exits the partnership, the brother owns it for a brief period, and then it gets sold to the German who came in to set it up. Now, interestingly, ever since then, 
until the end it remains with the German family. But the volume actually gets into interesting political dynamic of a German owning a press in British India. So the German actually gives a newspaper uh, a, a report, uh, an interview in Germany. And he says, you know why the, my press is doing so well? This is, of course, before World War I. He says, it's because I'm a German. The Indians hate the British so much that they're all gravitating towards this German guy. And this is one of the reasons why the press is doing so well. And of course, bootlegging begins. So if, you, if for all of you all who collect prints, a whole bunch of prints will say, printed as German. So they were trying to, you know, get onto this tide of anti-British sentiment and all that. Of course, this is still b before World War I when the Germans come under a different eclipse. Wonderful. So uh, in volume two, the first three prints of Shakuntala, Lakshmi and Saraswati are explored. What was the significance of these prints and their impact of Raja Ravi Varma during the time? So the first chromolithograph was the birth of Shakuntala. I love the spelling, um, Sakuntala. Uh, and it, you know, it is quite a large print. It's uh, 36 inches high. It's the largest in the print the press would ever make. And it was priced in 1894 at six rupees, a print, which in those days was a very, very expensive print to buy. Um, a lot of scholars have debated on why the press started with this. Uh, and multiple versions are there. Uh, one of the versions being that Shak the Menaka who you're seeing on the, or, uh, I'm sorry, Shakuntala is the foremother of Bharata. Bharata being, of course, the personification of India, this, that, and the other. So this is one of the versions which academicians refer to that perhaps this was a nationalist statement. I don't really quite subscribe to it because I think it's a stretch. But anyway, it starts with this. The second and third pictures are Lakshmi and Saraswati, and those were priced at two rupees each. So let's take a look. And both of these are the 1894 versions. They are actually extremely rare to come by now. But you know, uh, could you elaborate on the aspect of how the depiction of L Lakshmi transcends religious uh, boundaries during this period? It becomes quite omnipresent, right? Yes, in fact, um, so what actually happens is one, you see this Lakshmi becomes a brand, uh, much like the celebrated cinema actresses of today in those days, who did you gravitate to? You gravitated to the Lakshmi. And so this Lakshmi actually appears on so many things. But I want to talk about why the Lakshmi becomes very important from a religious point of view. You must keep in mind that in, this was in 1894, and the places of religious worship actually started opening up only in 1936 with the temple entry proclamation of uh, Chitratranal of Travancore. Until such time, most people didn't even know what a Lakshmi was or what a Lakshmi looked like, except the academic class or the elite people knew what it was, knew the iconography behind it, but the common man didn't. And this was their first actual view mm -hmm. of a religious image as Lakshmi. And so she really gets you know, taken in. Uh, the other important thing about it is the wonderful work done on how she becomes Bharat Mata. Hmm. And the Bharat Mata is actually styled after her, moving away from Abhinandanath Tagore's Banga Mata. So the popular art segment all follow this, this so, stereotype. So how did these prints contribute to the nationalist sentiment? I mean, in Raja Varimha's art navigated, how did it, there were legal challenges, right? To oh, that? Yeah, yeah, there were very many legal <laughs> challenges. <laughs> if you only you were around at that point of time. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So there was, there was a lot which was going on, and these prints actually got, um, did not get Ravi Varma into trouble, got the Ravi Varma press into trouble, because by the time Ravi Varma lived at a different political time, and by the time these start coming out and they become Bharat Matas and Kichaka Sairendri is considered to be Lord Curzon in India, and uh, 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 Markandeya is Mahatma Gandhi and Bharat Mata, when this happens, Ravi Varma is no longer alive, Ravi Varma is dead, but the press does come under fire, and the Indian Press Act is invoked on several occasions. Uh, they're called proscription proceedings, they're confiscated, uh, litigations take place, some of them come out, some of them don't. So how did the press leave this mark on 
shaping the ideologies and the cultural ethos for subsequent generations much later. Yes, in fact, what happens is, let's look at this. Um, you see, it, it becomes the mold which people even today are replicating into various forms. And this is one of the earliest ones where you have the Gangavatran, which becomes uh, a movie by Dadasai Palke of all people. So this is actually the, so if you actually see, it says uh, uh, Palke. And when Ravi Varm, uh, when Palke is uh, choreographing the movie, mm -hmm. and you can see the lobby card, he exactly takes it from the chromolithograph from the Ravi Varma press, the way in which Ganga is descending, condescendingly, and uh, Shiva is there, and uh, the way in which Parvati is also looking. All of this shapes not just cinema, it's shaping so many things. It shapes advertising, it shapes theater, um, and ev it resonates even today. Today, I mean, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, including recently uh, there was, uh, and it results in the sanctification of the image, mm. which I find is very interesting because um, uh, Ravi Varma came under heavy fire by the critics, but today it's, he's very sanctified. There was an instance of Adi Purush also recently. I had that question for you, but do oh, you want okay. to talk about it? So I'll tell you what happened. Sometime last year, early, early last year, I got this um, a telephone uh, a call from a reporter. Mm -hmm. who says, so have you, and I was having a bad day in court. Uh, so somebody says, uh, would you like to comment on Adi Purush? I didn't even know what Adi Purush was. So I said, okay, can you please explain what Adi Purush is? And he says, there's this movie in which a certain person is appearing as a Ravan. Do you think it's right? Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen the movie, so I said, what are you t why are you calling me? He says, you know, there's a petition before the Honorable Supreme Court challenging, and where this uh, movies come under fire, challenging the depiction of Ravan, and in the petition it actually says the ideal Ravan is that painted by Ravi Varma. The petition actually says that. So he says, what is your opinion? Do you think Ravi Varma painted the right Ravan? So I, I didn't know how to reply, and I, you know, for friends of mine who know me, if I'm very irritated, I start joking. I said, you know, I have to tell you something. I don't think Ravi Varma had tea with Ravan to know how he looked. <laughs> the guy gets furious. Not even coffee from your wife. Uh, no, not even coffee. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, not from that coffee machine. Then he says, uh, no, sir, you're not answering the question. You tell me whether Ravi Varma's depiction was right. I said, even I have not had tea with Ravan to see how he looks. <laughs> then this guy is really furious with me. He's not letting me go. He says, sir, you're not answering the question. I said, you're not asking the question. He says, what's the question? I said, the question is whether an image should be static or fluid. If it is static, then we have a problem. Is it the 10-headed Ravan? Is it the Ravi Varma Ravan? Is it some miniature or sculpture Ravan? But if it is fluid, anything goes. So then he disconnected the phone, fortunately didn't quote me. So. <laughs> now the elephant in the room is, I, I just want to know, you're, you're this, it's an obsession almost, right? So what kind of got you into art and, and Raja Ravi Varma? 30 years you've been working on this project, right? Yeah. So it actually has nothing to do with art. Uh, I have to <laughs> tell you how I started. Um, I'm actually a cancer survivor and I had a cancer of the pituitary right there. Uh, which was diagnosed and had uh, started rendering me blind in one eye. So I went through this surgery and all of that, uh, not very successful, uh, and then landed up under the care of this really brilliant neurosurgeon in Bangalore called R.M. Varma, uh, established the Nimhans and all of that. And he put me through every experimental treatment, radiation and chemo and all of that, and none of it was working. And one fine day, of course, I was I was a teenager and I, uh, you know, to get a cancer of the pituitary when you're a teenager is a bad thing, I can tell you that. Uh, and um, one day I went to him totally frustrated and I said, listen, there has to be some way out. And he very quietly turned around to me and said, look at art. And I was livid. I said, what are you Look at art. Uh, he says, no, listen, listen to this. He says, both the optic nerves converge over the pituitary. This eye feeds this portion of the brain. This eye feeds this portion of the brain. They cross over just above the pituitary. So if you look at good things, it could make you feel better. And he actually explained it further. He says, 
the first thing you would do if a car swerved is even when you see it, you would have turned the wheel. That's how important sight is. And when you look at a beautiful girl, you react just by looking at her. That's how beautiful sight is. So energize yourself by looking at beautiful things. In Bangalore, I can tell you at that point of time, there were no beautiful museums. Map was not even there. Map was not on the map. That comes later. Where do you get beautiful things? The chromolithographs from the Ravi Varma press, which were being discarded. So I can tell you, and it's not a prescription, I have to lodge the caveat. I can tell you for myself, color was my cure. And this is highly recommended. Look at beautiful things, enjoy beautiful things, and please smell the roses. Life is short. Wonderful. <laughs> they say a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Yes. Uh, but anyway, as a lawyer, now, how, it's very interesting. I heard you speak at the Bangalore Lit Fest, and you said, you know, because I was a lawyer, people let me in and gave me access. Uh, I to didn't that. say it. Somebody you, else you did. You said that. Come. <laughs> we'll go back and listen to those tapes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, as a lawyer, writing about art, how, is does this give you like a, a competitive advantage? Is it gives you a disadvantage? Do how do people actually take you seriously in the art world when your lawyers about, you know? The world I, is very... I have, to t I have to tell you, when I started writing the book, that was the first thing on my mind. Am I going to be taken seriously? I don't come from JNU and MSU or any You're of the You're in the Jaipur Literature Festival, so you know the answer. Yeah, I know, I, when I started. And uh, I have to... I, and in, it's inexplicable as to why every person I reached out to said yes. I don't know why. Uh, but I have to tell you this. Um, two things. One... The skill set which we as litigating lawyers use mm -hmm. is exactly the same skill set as an art historian. The murder's already taken place and then lands up in our doorstep to find out who the murderer is. Ravi Varma died a long time ago, now I have to figure out how he created the Lakshmi. So the skill set is exactly the same. I think what, where I am a bit ahead of the rest is because of 25 years of cross-examining and litigating, you know what evidence matters and what evidence doesn't matter that's you know you have to be analytical about it you can't go entirely using oral records he said she said we would have excluded it in law and so it's excluded here so there was somebody who said extramarital affair i said i don't know it's not there i'm not going to talk about it and it's irrelevant so it's it's incorrect to perpetuate something which is hearsay according to us this is one thing which i think helped me but the Question remained as to why the outsider should write mm -hmm. on art. And one day I was sitting and watching the cricket match and I said, that's the answer. So if I'm a spectator and I go to a game, and I'm sitting there with popcorn and coke and all of that, and I'm screaming at the guy saying, run faster, run faster, the player could simply turn around and say, hey, listen, pipe down. How do you know what I'm going through? I'm the one who's running. Valid argument. But then the outsider, the spectator can say, hey, buddy, who are you playing for? You're playing for me, no? Who is art for? It's for the public. Who is law for? It is for the public. It's not just for the people who are sitting in court and thrashing out gymnastic judgments. Who is law for? Law is for the public. Who is religion for? It is for the masses. Who is art for? Art is also for an outsider. So the validation takes place there. But then there's a second argument. The spectator can see what's going on behind the scene. So you, the player may be looking in front. I can see somebody behind you kind of trying to run out. So I have a better, better vantage of it. The player may have the view. The outsider has the vision. So I said, I sort of told myself, all right, there's some validation. Go ahead. Wonderful. In the interest of time, uh, does, do we have any audience questions or I can go on? Oh, wow. All right. Does, is there a mic? My okay, going to give you all we mics. don't have the books for sale here. Please photograph that. Those are the QR codes for sale in case you want. And I'm hoping you can leave that there. I'm advertising my book. <laughs> yes. Um, could you talk a little bit more about Raja Ravi Varma's artistic education and his influences? Because in his art, you see a lot of European influence, even with the image of the 
the princess, the queen, you can see him beautifying her a little bit. So just like what artist was he influenced by? What was his formal artistic education like? So if you're asking me about formal artistic education as did he go to an atelier and an Italian thing? No, he didn't. His um, training came from two, three people. One, of course, was the uncle whom you saw on the screen here. He did see Theodore Jensen paint. Ramaswamy Naidu refused to teach him. Ramaswamy Naidu's junior, Aramukam Pillai, comes in the night and quietly tells him. So this is as much as his artistic training went. So the answer is he was largely self-taught. This is one. Two, um, there were multiple influences. Volume 1, chapter 2 covers it. It starts with Kathakali, you get into other dance forms. Murals helped him. European art helped him. Photographs of models helped him. So there were a whole bunch of things. And Ravi Verma was very meticulous when he looked at stuff. So people today are actually looking at Ravi Verma's pictures because many of the wearings drape the sari drapes are vanishing, the Nainyat sari, the Navvari sari, all of them are mm -hmm. so beautifully de documented here. It's actually becoming an ethnographic study. Wonderful. There was a question that side, yeah, second row. Do you have a mic? Can we keep the questions a little short, guys? We want to take one or two more after this. Uh, I wanted to, to ask uh, that, you know, we have gone through all of this. Was there an obsession with the Farin uh, lovely thing with uh, the goddesses that he depicted? And even in Gangavtaran, we saw Shiva is also quite fair. So uh, was it because of a contrast factor in the chromolithograph so that, you know, they could be pronounced well? Or there was another story? Okay, so color is a very important dynamic when you look at Ravi Varma. Uh, when it came to religious images, Ravi Varma did actually follow what the description was. Shiva is fair, um, spatika mani nebam parvati sham namami, so he's this color of spatik, which is absolutely fair, except for a blue throat, which must have made him look very handsome. Um, in so far as Rama, there's actually a reference. There is a letter in the divisional archives in Mysore, which um, before he paints the Rama, he says, here are two sketches which I'm sending you. I'm going to start working on the final one. Uh, tell me whether you should, I, you want it in blue or in the natural flesh tint. The final paintings are of natural color, but the sketches are blue. So if you look at the sketches being closer to the mind of the artist, he envisioned them blue. But the final patron says fair. So you know, when it goes from the sketch to the painting, you do know what the additional influences are. He did print Kali, which was blue. Now, these, this is one argument. The other argument is he did use fair and dark in order to show a power differentia. So, for example, in The Lady Giving Arms, which is a secular one of a girl throwing a coin at a beggar or something like that, she is fair and he's extremely dark. So, Ravi Varma does in some cases use skin complexion as a metaphor for power differentia. In some, he doesn't. I think uh, we don't have time for another question. Ganesh will be outside. You can ask him your questions. Um, but thank you so much, Ganesh. Just any l closing words? I mean, after R Ravi Varma, now who's the next obsession going to be? I, I, I am looking at the dynamic of patronage post-independent India uh -huh. uh, from a legal and policy point of view. Because I'm very interested in, you know, I'm sort of bored of the colonial narrative. I think it's been done to death. I want to know what Indians have done to Indians because it's 75 plus years and I think we have enough baggage to oh, examine that. Wonderful. And we know he's not going to get sued since he's a lawyer. No, but it'll be done. <laughs> I don't mind someone suing me, please. <laughs> okay, anybody, you're, we've all signed on the NDAs already, so yeah. we can't do much. Yeah. But thank you so much. Thank you for being here bright and early on a Saturday morning. Uh, always a pleasure chatting with you, Ganesh. And Likewise. Hopefully, Volume 3, 4, 5, 6 will be at uh, Avid in Bombay. Yes, lovely. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>